In war-torn Afghanistan, simply going to school can be a privilege, especially if you're a girl. Two out of three girls don't attend school, despite billions of dollars in aid spent on education over the last two decades. I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we investigate why so many of Afghanistan's girls are kept outside of the classroom. It's the dawn of a new school day across Afghanistan. And girls from the Dashti Barchi district, a poor neighborhood in West Kabul, begin making their way to class. First, a trickle, and soon a steady stream. By 6 a.m., they are pouring through the gates, thirsty for knowledge, ready to learn. If 6 a.m. seems early for school, it is. That's because this is the first of three shifts here. It's the only way to accommodate the more than 14,000 students on the school roll, split almost evenly between girls and boys. Over the next week, we've been given extremely rare access inside the Sayeda Shahada School to try to understand what life is like for a girl going to school in Afghanistan. In school, um, the condition is too hard for girls. Uh, in our country, um, we have lots of problems. But in the school, um, we have more problems. 16-year-old Madnaz Aliyar has been a student at Sayed al-Shahada since grade one. Over that time, she and Principal Akila Tavakoli have seen the numbers of girls at their school more than double. OK, Melissa? Yeah. It's our school. And uh, we have uh, seven or eight buildings here. And uh, there are uh, 7,000 students here, uh, the girls. 7,000 just girls? Yes, just girls, 7,000. The huge increase in the numbers of girls studying at Sayed al-Shahada is a welcome sign of progress, compared to the days when the Taliban were in power and girls were forbidden from going to school. But the school's enormous growth has a major consequence too many students and not enough classrooms. So we have a few buildings here. Yes. Which ones are for girls? She's saying that uh, that building is from the boys, that building is for the, from the boys, that building are from the boys. Uh, those uh, we are seeing the buildings, these are all the boys. All the buildings all are the for boys. All the buildings are the boys, yes. Where are the girls? That's the school of the girls. We don't have classroom to study. We don't have buildings also. And that's just for girls. Uh, all of them, these buildings are from the bus, but we don't have any building. How many classes? Uh, in three times, we have uh, more than 40 classes. 40 classes? Yes, 40 classes. Three times a day? Yes, three times a day. Uh, especially girls, okay? Just girls are there. The boys will not go there. Hotel. 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 Ibrahim. 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 Ki. Ki. Kili. 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 Limo. There is only one high school in this neighborhood, which is why the girls come from far away. The population is growing day by day. The girls come knocking on our door to be enrolled. We cannot tell them no. We have to accept them, but we don't have enough space. That's why we have problems. Lack of infrastructure is only one of many reasons why so many Afghan girls are out of school. In fact, no one actually knows how many girls are in school, not even the Afghan government. The Ministry of Education is not sure how many students are there. Is it 11 million or is it 7.2 million? Is it 8 million? 
Nobody knows exactly how many students are there. That's just one of several findings of a recent independent review on corruption within the Ministry of Education. Released late last year, the results made headlines across the country. It found widespread corruption throughout the education system. Muzaffar Shah is the former director of Afghanistan's anti-corruption watchdog and author of the report. After spending billions and billions of dollars in the last 16 years, um, we have not been able actually to have any kind of building for most of those schools. Our finding shows that uh, literally money was taken in cash to remote parts of Afghanistan by the trustees and uh, we had information that the money did not make to the right people. At Sayyid al-Shahada, there aren't even enough classrooms for the boys. Many classes are held in the hallways or in stairwells, wherever a teacher can carve out space. The only place you won't find boys attending class is in a tent or out in the open with the girls. Uh, see, in the past, when uh, we were uh, together, boys and girls, we didn't uh, face to lack of the classes, okay? We had enough classes here, but right now we have too much people, we have too much students here. Because of this, there is no place. Recognizing the desperate need at the school, Japanese donors built two new buildings five years ago, so girls would have their own classrooms. But the school shura, the community leaders, decided to give those buildings to the boys. It is, the school is, uh, belongs to us, to girls, because when the foreigners were coming, we were under the sun, we were under the rain. But the foreigners mix, even did the schools for us. But right now it's the, uh, the boys school, I don't know why. Do you feel angry about that? Uh, I feel angry, yes, because in the past, it, uh, the foreigners, when they are coming, so they will think about us, about, about the girls, okay? But right now it's the boys school, I don't know why. <laughs> And it's right, it makes me really uh, angry. That's why always the right of the girls are like this. Improving education, especially for girls, is a well-known objective for international donors. Principal Akila says the local community gave the buildings to the boys, thinking that donors would come back to build more classrooms for the girls. <laughs> People think NGOs come here to work only for girls. So the community decided the buildings should be for the boys. I don't know if the school's management or others interfered. These issues are always decided by the males and the school management. Uh, did the donors ever come back after they built the building? They came once to visit then went back. The security situation continues to deteriorate in Afghanistan. As a result, very few international donors are able to visit the projects they support. So many rely on third-party monitors to do that work, which, according to the Anti-Corruption Committee, opens yet another avenue for corruption. We've, we found that the school monitors, and instead of doing proper monitoring of the quality of the education, uh, they have been working for themselves, you know, to go to some of the school, to kind of harass the teachers in the school administration, get money from them, and then do their evaluation once they were happy. We had an example, uh, a school that we were working with in Barakshan, which has a thousand uh, kids on the register. Well, actually, when we went in there, there were 12 kids coming to school. Ian Kaplan is a researcher who contributed to the anti-corruption report. As an education specialist, he works with a Norwegian NGO, providing support for schools throughout Afghanistan, 
including this school for the deaf in Kabul. They're using Afghan sign language, which is its own unique language. Kaplan says he's fortunate to be able to visit the projects his NGO supports. Uh, it's, it's often kind of difficult for donors to be able to do that because of security concerns, but also sometimes there's not always the interest to go out and follow up on these things and to go out and visit, so it doesn't happen very often. I think, I mean, you get a, f a feeling for something in a way that you don't if you're sitting behind a desk. You know, you see people and you, you see them engaging and learning, and I mean, for me, that's the reason to be here. Without that, I would just lose the feeling for it, I think, altogether. But he says lack of donor access and oversight is only one of the issues affecting girls' education in Afghanistan. Why are girls lacking so much more than boys when it comes to education? Well, I think, you know, at least in the past, uh, there had been just much more of a focus on just getting anyone into school first, and then it was easier to get boys into school. And, um, and, you know, and also just because of gender norms, you know, that the more attention has been focused on boys than on girls generally. See, in this country that we are living, um, they're always saying, saying that the girls cannot, the girls cannot, the girls cannot. Always saying the girls cannot. As the top levels of the Afghan government and the international community deal with the findings of the anti-corruption report, the staff and the girls at Sayyid al-Shahada face more immediate issues. The first shift of the school day, from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., is almost over. And while four hours might seem a little light on school time, it may be a blessing in disguise, because any longer and the girls may have to use the toilets. We have 7,000 girls but both male and female students have to use the same toilets. We tell them during assemblies, do it at home before coming to school. Have you ever gone to the toilet in your school? Yes. Uh, I um, was uh, seven years old that I went to school, and uh, it's a really bad situation there. That uh, even the, the girls cannot go there even because of the, the bikes are so, um, what should I say, um, so bad, what's the word? Impolite, rude, yes, they are impolite. Poor working conditions in most schools make it more difficult to attract female teachers. Yet they're desperately needed because many families still will not accept men teaching their daughters. We have only 54 full-time teachers, including principal and admin staff. So this is the problem. We don't have enough teachers and we have to take temporary staff. But because our school is far away, many female teachers can't come. Far away is simply the outskirts of western Kabul. But it's too far for female teachers unfamiliar with the neighborhood or uncertain about its security. It's a paradox. Principal Akila cannot recruit enough women to teach at her school. Yet, it's estimated that up to 75% of teaching graduates are unemployed, and most of them are women. At the Sayyid Jamaluddin Teaching College, in a more affluent district of Kabul, Afghanistan's next generation of teachers is learning the best techniques to connect with their future students. But every one of these graduates knows a good education is not always enough to land a teaching job. I studied inside Jamaluddin School and graduated from class 14. I majored in Dari and came second in the class. Then I tried looking for a good job. Zakara Ahmadi graduated three years ago from this college, but she is still looking for work. We try our best to get jobs in the legal way, but we cannot get anything. But there is another way, which is illegal, but I have never tried that. I try my best to do things legally, but it hasn't worked yet. Of all the findings in the anti-corruption report, the issue highlighted as most devastating was the poor quality of teachers throughout the country. 
jobs were given to those who could afford to pay a bribe, not those who were best qualified. It's hard to slap a percentage on this stuff, but the majority of teachers that we spoke with suggested that teachers coming in, in recent years have to pay a year's salary in advance to be able to even get a teaching position. What about your classmates who you graduated with? Do any of them have jobs? Are they in the same position as you are? As far as I know, none of them have secured a future either. The problem is that we have to have qualified teachers, actually. It's not about the number of the teacher, it's about the quality of the teacher. Um, uh, we came across instances where, you know, uh, a religious school graduate was teaching you know, physics in math to the students. He didn't know anything himself about that subject. I think what's happening now more and more is that kids are, you know, leaving school because their experience is, is just so miserable and they're not learning and it just doesn't prepare, doesn't prepare children for work or for life. Um, and so what's the point? It's early afternoon and the students and staff of Sayed al-Shahada have another major problem to deal with. This is the courtyard of the Sayed Shahada school where most of the girls take their classes. But this afternoon, behind me, there's a massive storm brewing. And if the rain gets any heavier, school is over for the day. Do you think it's fair that boys always have classrooms and girls have to sit outside? It's a problem then, because they're not equal in our country, they're not equal. They are thinking that the boys are, they have right, but the girls, uh, they don't have right. They have class, but the girls don't have class. For example, my, my brothers are not, they, they are boy, they have class. My sister, uh, I think uh, more than five years, they sit in outside in front of the sun, uh, under the rain and those days that uh, there was run, so they will, not teach, uh, they will not teach anyone, they will not study something, they will come back home. It's harder to learn when yes, you're outside, right? Yes, of course. So they cannot learn knowledge under the rain. The rain will come. As the sky gets darker, and knowing some of the girls have up to an hour's walk to get home, Principal Akila waits no longer. And after just an hour and a half of lessons, the girls are sent on their way. Afghanistan has never had so many students going to school. Even with the lack of security in some parts of Afghanistan, we still have the, the, the quantity, actually. We have uh, uh, between seven to eight million students going to school. As I said, we don't know the exact number, but I think that's a significantly good number. But I think the quality of education, what is more important, we don't have that. We have very poor quality education. And that goes back to many things. You know, corruption is one of the major causes of having poor quality education. Did you have to convince your dad to let you go to school? Of course. Um, my father was a little, uh, um, uh, he was not okay that I should go to school. And before uh, he was saying something, not that you don't go to school. Uh, like this, no, uh, just saying that school is not good for girls. Or for example, um, the girls should work in, uh, in the home and uh, for cleaning, washing, like these things. And um, right now he's okay. I'm always saying for him that yes, it's the world has changed and we should uh, learn knowledge, we should go to school. Nanaz's father, Aladad, runs a small store around the corner from the family home. He and his wife have six children. Nanaz is the oldest. This business is the sole source of income Aladad has to provide for his family. I have never been to school. I can't even understand a simple sentence. Afghan tradition dictates the eldest daughter should stay home to take care of the family. Nanaz does that. She cooks, 
cleans, and looks after her siblings before and after school. But she's also impressed her family with how hard she studies. She is very intelligent. She's now in grade 11. The last few years she was number one in school, and now she's number two. Did you encourage her to go to school? Yes, it was with our encouragement, a mother and father, that she is now in grade 11 and number two in school. Do you ever worry about your daughters when they walk off to school? Yes, I worry, because the security has not been good for the last few years. This year, the security is much worse. That's why we worry. Even today, there was a bomb blast. That blast was just two kilometers away, targeting a voter registration center. 60 people were killed. But it did not stop Madnaz from going to school a few hours later. The senior girls attend the last shift of the day from 1 to 5 p.m. The community won't allow teenage boys and girls to mix, so no boys are present during the afternoon shift. It's one of the few times the girls can use the buildings that were actually built for them. Always I'm saying to myself, Mahnaz, this situation is not good. You have to change the situation. Uh, just start, change at uh, first your family, your neighborhood. After that, you can be successful to serve your people. Always I'm saying for myself, I can. I can everything. I can do this, I can do this. Uh, like these things, I can. While Manoz looks with hope to all that is possible, Principal Akila continues to deal with the seemingly impossible. Even after the boys have left school for the day, there's still not enough classrooms for all the girls, and at times, not enough teachers. For those working every day in Afghanistan's schools, the strain is evident and the future uncertain. The responsibility of being a principal is too much. They ask a lot of me. They don't have carpet or chairs, and I don't think I can get them. If I were just a teacher, it would be better. Whether the reforms recommended in the anti-corruption report will help Principal Akila remains unclear. But the fact that the report was commissioned and released at all may be seen as a sign of progress. We did have resistance. Uh, first of all, the ministry resisted and said, you know, we have done a lot of good work in the last two, three years. And your report does not reflect those good, good works we have done. And, and uh, we clearly said that, you know, this report is not about the good works we have done. The reaction to the report was swift, with President Ghani himself promising to implement all the recommendations. But any improvements that result may be too late for Manoz. She's hoping to be at university after she finishes high school next year. After that, I will get a job. After that, I have planned to go in uh, this, um, what's Aminyat in English? Security? Security, no, uh, Siasat. Politics. Politics. I'm good at politics, and I want to supply everything for the girls. It's my wishes. My father does not agree with me. Well, my father does not agree what with me. What does he say? He's saying, <laughs> he's saying that um, for girls, just being a doctor or being a teacher, it's good for the girls. But I'm saying, no, I want to supply for the girls. It's estimated that more than 60% of Afghanistan's girls are not in school. So Manoz's dream to provide a better future for them is both bold and daunting. But given the challenges that she and many of her classmates have faced just to go to school, 
anything seems possible. You never feel like it's too hard. Sometimes. Sometimes it's hard. But again, when I um, think something, when I, uh, again, think uh, that how is the world, about the world when I'm thinking, again, I, I will say that for myself that, yes, you can. For now, decisions about girls' education still lie mainly with men who run the ministry and fathers who rule the home. That may slowly be evolving. Manoz has convinced her father to let her go to university. Where once he questioned whether she should study at all, the debate now is whether she studies medicine or politics. But girls like Manoz and her peers will have to keep fighting to change the future for themselves and for the next generation of Afghanistan's girls. When are you happiest? Happiest when my father supporting me. When, for example, my father say that, uh, yes, you are my girl and I'm proud of you. It's the happiest time I have. Does, that, does he say that a lot? Yes, sometimes.